And I'll just finish on 1 John because 1 John, if you read through 1 John, I think is the most abused um, book when it comes to this whole idea of works proving your faith. And there are, you know, to, to be honest, I think there are a lot of hard verses in there that do sort of start to allude to that. Um, and before I just hit John 3, let, let me just uh, go to um, a couple really quick. First uh, John 2. Here's one of them. And, and as we read through this verse, just remember that question in the beginning that I asked was, if works shows that you're saved, how much works do you need in order for this verse to mean that? Because if you read through these verses, the verses that they're using to try and say, well, this is how I know I'm saved. I mean, I read these verses and if I took it that way, it would mean I'm not saved or I'm not understanding it the way they are. Or if I did understand it the way they are, it's not showing me that I'm saved. Look at this one. Hereby we do know that we know him. So it's saying, oh, here, see, if you're saved, you know him. If we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, if somebody <laughs> preaches that verse and says, well, you're in sin, you're not in church, you're not soul winning, therefore you don't know God, well then why is the bar set there? At soul winning and church and reading, like, why is the bar not perfection like we saw before? If you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. So how, how can I take this verse and say, well, I know God because of my works, because I don't keep all the commandments. So therefore, this verse would actually mean, as, if I take it as a Christian as a whole, would mean that I don't know God. And that I am a liar because I say, I say I know God, but I'm not keeping all the commandments. So this is not how we interpret these verses, because if we did, it would condemn all of us. Because none of us then would know God. All of us would be liars if we know God, meaning we're a believer, but, but we're still sinning. So as we go through a couple of these other verses, we, we have to understand that there is a new man and that there is an old man. And I believe John, 1 John is not a, a book trying to give you evidence of your faith, I believe it's a book talking about the difference between the old man and the new man and how we differentiate between the two. But because we have both, um, some of them, are, they apply to us, but not in the complete sense of the entire Christian. Uh, look at this, another one. Uh, oh, not that one, sorry. Um, 28. And now, little children, verse 28, abide in him that when, ye shall, when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. So they say, ah, see, there you go. If you believe, you're going to do righteousness. Well, again, remember, well, how much righteousness do I need in order to know I'm born of him? If I'm determining whether or not I'm righteous by my works, because I sin still. So am I born of God if that's the way I'm going to interpret that verse? Uh, and you know, John 3 is like the, the nail in the coffin, how this, this John cannot be talking about, you know, proving your salvation by works. I mean, look at what it says in 1 John 3. Uh, let's read from verse 4. Who co whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression, transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. So this is not saying that you're, you're, you're only going to sin a little. This is saying that if you abide in Christ, you're not sinning at all. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the, de for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. So not only do you not sin, you're not even capable of sinning, if you take this verse to mean that a Christian, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So think about it. If we were to take this verse, 
to mean, well, we prove whether or not we saved, whether, whether we sin or not. I mean, this, this verse, according to that interpretation, is going to prove that everyone is of the devil and nobody is born of God. So what is the right interpretation of the, this verse in context with the rest of the Bible? Well, again, it's the new creature, isn't it? It's the new man and the old man, the good tree and the bad tree. This is showing you that the good tree, the new man, the, the new creature that is born of God does not sin, that spirit that dwells in us. And then we have the flesh, which I believe is of the devil. And that is not born of God, that doesn't do righteousness. Um, and that's why we commit sin. So it's a comparison of the two. It's not saying, well, if you sin, you're saved, or you're not saved. And if you don't sin, uh, you, you are saved. Some people will try and say, well, it's saying here that, you know, not that you commit sin, but it's just a lifestyle of sin. But that's not what this verse is saying. I mean, you read it. It's not, it, it, is it alluding to a lifestyle of sin? It's saying that you can't, it's not possible that you even sin at all. Um, because you're born of God. So we can't just change this passage to mean what we want it to mean just because we want to use our works as an evidence of, of salvation or an evidence of faith. So we saw a lot of verses and, and the way I believe we understand them is the new man and the old man and that's why they're such extremes. Keep the commandments or otherwise you're condemned. You know, you either have good tree or you have a good fruit or bad fruit. You either sin or you don't because these two natures are there that we have and we have both of them. And so we need to understand these verses in the context of that doctrine. Now somebody might ask a question after listening to this sermon and say, well, you know, Victor, Aren't you, aren't you just, I mean, you, these verses are pretty clear that you need works in order to be saved. Aren't you just twisting scripture to, to make it fit what you believe? Well, you know, in a sense I am, because that's what we need to do in order to harmonize all scripture. We need to understand scripture because the Bible says, you know, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So we have to take into account all scripture. We don't twist it. You know, we, 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 make, we know exactly what it says. The question is, do we have the right understanding of it in light of all the other scriptures? Because, yeah, God's word can be understood one way or another, but we make sure we have the right understanding when we compare all of scripture. I remember me and Michael, we were talking to this lady and um, she was going on about Calvinism and saying, oh, you know, there are verses that allude to Calvinism. And I said, well, there, there are verses that sound like Calvinism. But, you know, we need, to, we need to take a verse and we need to take all of Scripture and then we need to decide which, which position is the sound position taking all Scripture into account. And if we take all Scripture into account, we can see that the verses that allude to Calvinism can be explained another way and then that lines them up with the other Scriptures we see that contradict Calvinism. So that's why I would want to take that position because I can harmonize all the scripture and get a meaning that is consistent across all the Bible rather than pulling one verse out. I mean, we saw that example in James, right? If we just take James chapter 2 out and say, faith without works is dead, and we take the position, well, if you don't have works, you're not saved. Well, that is obviously the wrong interpretation with the rest of the Bible. So we are misunderstanding James 2. We take that interpretation because we have not taken all scripture into account and made a sound position with what the scripture is teaching as a whole. That's how we get a sound doctrine. 